Hey, good morning, good morning, my brothers and my sisters. That was a little shaky there this morning. That said uh, there was no internet connection. I was trying to reconnect and all of these things. Here is the sanctuary of the Church Town Church of God. How about that? Got the screen down because I never put it up after we showed uh, Noah a couple of Fridays ago. If you were here for that, a lot of people came to see that. So let's go put the screen up, open up the church. There's a lot that needs to be done today. There's all of the electronics. We have portable everything. We are so fortunate here. We have portable everything. Have church, will travel. And we were able to travel outside. There it is. That's what we're looking for. There would be like a how-to video on YouTube. There we go. Watch. Oh. Ah. Hi, Bryn. How is everybody there? How are all three of you doing? I didn't get a chance to see you again on Sunday. I'm so sorry. Oh, my goodness. I want to see all my friends. It seems like so many people, so little time. But here we are. Isn't it beautiful? There's the sun beaming through. That's a second commandment violation above the altar. Graven image. Oh, my. There it is. Lights. Now, I have nothing ready for this morning because I goofed off yesterday. I know that I should not ever do this, but I took a day off. I took off with the family. And I took off with Olivia and Ryan, and we drove south to a place that we know that has great outdoor dining, a big spread. It was just a fantastic afternoon, Sunday afternoon. Hold on here, folks. See, this is all of our stuff that we need. Ah. I'm so excited, Bryn. I've got another great wedding coming up. Um, you know, family members here in the church a couple of weddings coming up, actually, and I just, you know, it's just a great, great, great joy, uh, a great joy to be doing that, being able to serve in that way. We are extremely well, very well, physically, doing well emotionally, doing well spiritually. You guys know, I let you know. Now, I'm going to go over here <laughs> because... Well, no, I've got Bibles everywhere. I don't need to go over there and find a Bible. I've got my Bible right here, another Bible. This was a Bible that I was gifted for my lifetime ordination. So why don't we uh, open up with just a word of prayer? I know you don't want to see my mug yet, so we'll just pray here. Father God, thank you so much for the time that we get to share together. Oh, in Jesus' name, we pray for your wisdom in this conversation. Lord, we love you. We appreciate you. I hope we tell you that enough. Hey, thank you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you have done. Thank you for what you do every single day. Oh, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. There we go. Hold on. There we go. Too bright? Okay, now you guys get to vote. This is A, this is B. So would you please vote? A, B. The service on Sunday was, it moved on its own. You know, there are times when things move on their own and, and not really on their own, right? Okay, God's Holy Spirit moves and things change. And I really was when, you know, you talk about threading the needle theologically and politically. <laughs> when you open up by reading the, thank you, 
You can always count on Andy. This is B. This is A. I'm going with B. Um, good morning, Renee. But I wanted to show the theology behind the what we call the founding fathers. And there is indeed theology there. Whether they are a practicing, whether one of them was a practicing Christian, right? As we would say, main Orthodox Christian, a theist, oh, I believe in a God. Deist, I believe in a God who is far distant. Whether any and all of those were in play with our founding fathers, there was this core belief in creator. In what we, you might call, a, what, what was it called a decade ago? Um, intelligent design, a creator, a mind. Good morning, Michelle. We love you guys. We love, you know, just there's people. Who are people? Oh, I love people. Okay, and so when we, they talk about that, and, and in, inherent in this idea of a creator is the idea that we are his image bearers. Good morning, Dee Dee. And inherent in his, um, sorry, I was distracted by a message. Inherent in his image bearers are these rights that we have as such. And this is the foundational premise of self-government. Because the founding fathers knew that people given over to their own selves are wicked and governments given over to its own worship of self is wicked. The great experiment of the United States was that we understand that we are created by God and as such by the power of God, endowed with the power of God. So it wouldn't be us per se in government. It would be the power of God working through us and that can produce actual good decisions. There is no good within me, Paul says. What a wretched creation I am, broken away from God. Who can help me from this state? Thank God for Jesus Christ. So through Jesus Christ, the indwelling of God's Holy Spirit, I put one foot in front of the other. I can make good decisions by his power alone because there is no good within me. So our found that, that is a tremendous risk when you're founding a nation on such principles that you do, by the power of God, have the capacity to self-govern. And I don't mean just create governmental structures that then govern, you know, like the, like the DMV or taxes or whatever the case may be. Self-govern. Brian Warner, by the power of God, can regulate my own behavior. I don't need an outside entity lording over me. And so when in, inculcated in all of those writings is that tension between the ind, individual liberties and the necessity, the necessity for certain services and organizational principles of government. And, there, and, and the, the founding documents are all about this tension and the idea of government of the people, for the people, by the people is designed to address that tension so that government never gets to be the way it is today with a bunch of just professional billion and trillionaire people, right? But throughout the course of history, that is where government has always gone because government is wicked. People are wicked. When we turn our backs and we begin to follow the God of secular progressivism, when we begin to follow the God of statism, when we begin to follow the God of fill in the blank, we are lost. We are Romans 1 and 2. We are no longer Romans 7. Individuals empowered by God to move through this life, understanding right and wrong, and by the power of God having the capacity to choose right. So 
I hope that I, I hope that I painted that picture on Sunday. And then, and then as it turned out, as I heard after the service, you know, when I went full on into Romans 7 and into Romans 8, and the idea of the struggle is real, right? You know that cliche? When I went back and I preached that again, and it seems that I preached that over and over for a reason, because the struggle is real for every Christian. We're talking about Christians here. And the premise of the preaching was, I would rather be in the struggle of Romans 7 than lost to sin and condemned to hell in Romans 1 and 2. You want Romans 1 and 2? You want Romans 7. Romans 7 doesn't sound like a whole lot of fun, but we all know that the joy and the power and the fellowship that we shared, the love that we feel for one another, it's totally worth it. It's totally worth it. The idea, the idea that if I grieve, I know that brothers and sisters will grieve with me. They actually care is totally worth it. And when we laugh, the idea that we laugh together, we live together, we grow, all those things. Although we are moving in that tension between feeding the sinful flesh and being spiritually reborn by the power of God, and it ain't easy, it's worth it. So I went full into that. And then some of the feedback that I received was, man, how did you know this was going on in my life? I don't know a thing. And that's not some sort of like, hey, this, you know, I don't know a thing. But I, I try to practice what I preach when I say that when, when you're in a ministry, good morning, Mary, when you're in a ministry situation and you are given over to the power of God's Holy Spirit, he will place you where you need to be. He will put the words into your mouth and he will motivate you to perform the actions that he wants you to perform. You'll feel it, you'll know it. And, and if we all live in our giftings, if we do what we're called to do, I say this probably every day of my life, if we do what we're called to do and we trust that God will do what he promises to do, it works out a lot better. And that's what happens in church. We can plan all we want. We could plan and we could bring people together. We could rehearse 50 times a week getting ready for Sunday morning. God, if we are truly submitted to God's Holy Spirit, he'll do what he wants. And as often as not, he takes the outline that I have in my head and uses it for his purposes. That's a good thing. That's a good thing. So that's, that's where we were on Sunday, you know, Romans 7, Romans 8, and talking about, because originally, you know, when I, made, when I built that bridge between the preamble of the Declaration of Independence and the theology behind it, as I explained at the beginning of this stream, then I was going to move into who can free me from the power of sin. And that's, you know, Paul talks about in Romans, all throughout Romans, but six, seven, eight, nine, he talks about two things, entities here at work within him. One is the power of sin. And that is a reference to the power of Satan, if you will. It is, the, it is the New Testament idea that we are not indwelled by God's Holy Spirit. I've turned my back on that relationship, if that makes sense. I, now I, I'm given over to the power of self, the power of the God of this world, the power of sin. So he talks about the power of sin. And then, he, you know, the motivation, if you will, to do self-serving, self-ish, self-harmful things. And then he talks about the behaviors that stem from that. So who can break me from the, the power of sin, which leads to the behaviors of sin? How I am a slave to that by my broken nature. 
I'm just given over to that. Naturally, I am given over to that. You cannot escape that. If you are not a child of God, you are a slave to sin. But hearing the gospel, turning, repenting, I may become a bond servant of Christ, a voluntary slave, if you will. A voluntary, I give my life to you, Lord. I am open, I am willing, here I am, Lord. All of the things that the Christian says. I become a bond servant, a voluntary slave to Christ. See the difference? And he'll go on in Romans 10 to say, then how can all of this happen if nobody hears the gospel? How can, how can anybody hear the gospel if nobody preaches the gospel? How can any, nobody preach the gospel if they don't know the word of God? So all of those things. So you know the, 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 the thinking, feeling, rational child of God who is at current creation of God, who is currently outside of the kingdom of God, hears the word, the power of God's Holy Spirit, the wisdom of the word, acts on the heart and the mind, convicts, motivates, moves an individual to turn and to repent and to open themselves up to more. Open themselves up to this salvation, this free gift that's just waiting there. Good stuff. That's good stuff. So, that's what we did on Sunday. And again, it, it, sometimes I feel as though the, the, the service goes all over the place. But we've had so many examples um, lately of just the ministry of the Holy Spirit at Churchtown. So many examples say, you know, this little church, individuals, I believe are drawn here or are called here for such a variety of different reasons. But basically it breaks down into two categories and they overlap dramatically. And those are those who are the healers and those who are in the need of healing. And of course, the healers will be in need of healing at times. And hopefully those who are in need of healing will grow and become and, and become a part of those who are the healers. But the, the church, this church is absolutely a hospital. I, I, I don't know how else to describe it. This place is a hospital. It sees a lot of action. Good morning, Marty. It sees a lot of action. It sees a, a lot of battles, spiritual battles are fought here in the individual and sometimes it spills over into the physical and, but that's, it's a, it's a battleground. It's a hospital for hurting people. And that, I think that's the way it should be, right? Because there are, I don't know, we're willing. There are times, I said I had a good friend, you know, all of these things going on, and, and she said, well, what, what can we do? And I said, stay in the fight. Just stay in the fight. Romans 7, stay in the fight. Right? Because the, bat, the, the, the war is won. And Satan will do anything and everything to try to grab an individual and turn them against God. He doesn't want Romans 7. He wants that individual firmly embedded in Romans 1 and 2. Turn your back on God. It's totally not worth it. It is totally worth it. The joy, the power, the wisdom, the peace, the being content in all circumstances, seeing the bigger picture of life. Where death, even the, the fear of death is conquered. You know where, you know, in my worldview, you know where death is? It has its place for sure. I understand about my own mortality, but it's not here. It's over here where it needs to be. It's a part of the big picture of life. It's that transition 
that I will make, you know, to be absent in the bodies, to be present with the Lord. And then we look forward to the recreation of heaven and earth, all of those things. But I've been free from the power of sin, Romans 7. I've been free from the power of sin, freed from the power of sin by the work on the cross. And I've been freed from death. And that is the fear of death now. And of course, I will, the eternal life to come with Christ in the spiritual and in the physical. So, why am I, why would I be wrapped up in, in this minutia over here when I have a bigger understanding? Does that make sense? <clears throat> so, yeah, I, I, I see what, and I think that, you know, churches, that, that, that's the cliche, right? It's a hospital, not a museum. And we, we see a church town, it's definitely a hospital. And we definitely, um, it's a battleground, both at the same time sometimes. Good morning, Barry. Both at the same time sometimes. <clears throat> it's like Gettysburg, right? Oh, my goodness gracious. So that's what we did on Sunday. And, you know, I wanted to draw that out on July 4th. Um, and because of Independence Day, right? Because of Independence Day, even though I got in trouble for singing God Bless the USA. So, absolutely, there is that contrast. Um, but one of the things I think when we talk about the United States as being a Christian nation, we can have that conversation and we can go back and forth. Is it a Christian nation? You're going to have to define what you mean by Christian nation. It, make, it makes perfect sense. You stated it perfectly. The contrast between good and evil. You understand what I'm saying? You would have to explain your definition of Christ. But there is no denying the fact that underlying the founding documents is a theology of creation and an understanding of a creator God and a power of God in that creation. That's the theology that is brought out, that we are all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. I mean, they're natural and there is, like <laughs> Paul talks about in Romans 8, there is nothing on earth that can separate you from these rights that you have. You're born with them because you're born differently than a beast of the field. You're born as an image bearer of the Most High God. You have the right to life, which we forget about that. Right? The, the argument for abortion needs to come down to that's not a human being or not an American citizen from the time of conception because American citizens are given the right to life. You've got to take it down to that level, which I don't think that you can because then, especially Christians, because then you're saying, and I've said this before, you're saying, well, there was a time then that uh, Jesus was not a human being. He was not fully human and not fully divine. I'm going to throw away the hypostatic union, I'm going to throw away Christian orthodoxy at the altar of abortion because I'm going to say for a three-month period of time, Jesus wasn't either one. He was just a zygote, a clump of cells. So if the Christian is going to say, hey, that's not a human being and, and it's your God-given right, if you want to get rid of that clump of cells, feel free, I think you need to check your theology. You, got it. you have to check your Bible at the door there. You have to check your theology there. Because there was never not a time when Jesus wasn't fully human and fully divine. Fully divine, and may I emphasize, fully human in that case. Just saying. So we have the right to life. It's written into our Constitution. We have the right to liberty. And that liberty is what really the foundational, like, okay, if you're left to your own devices, libertarian or whatever, where will you go with that? Well, now you can get into all kinds of secular philosophies and the greater good and blah, blah, blah. But what the founding fathers were saying was that we are endowed by our creator. The power of God is the only thing 
that can help us to choose what is right because, as Paul clearly states, there is no good within me. The right to liberty. <clears throat> and that's the great experiment. And the pursuit of happiness. Big, open-ended statement there. The pursuit of happiness. Originally it said life, liberty, and property. Because property ownership back in the day, as they say, was the defining factor between the haves and the have-nots. If you had property, you could literally own other people, right? Property. But it was changed at the last minute to the pursuit of happiness to become more open-ended because your happiness as a free moral agent may look different than my happiness as a free moral agent, but we are both trusted by, trusted that we will pursue that happiness in a civil way. See, it is a tremendous experiment. Incredible experiment. So there are remnants of that still in our government 200 plus years later, obviously. But we see that our government has devolved into basically an oligarchical structure. As governments do, they, they go from a more democratic than this, you know, representative democracy, whatever you want. They go from a more democratic, open type of society where um, the power of government is derived by the governed and they devolve, they cycle through this idea. They cycle through the phases of political development into oligarchy, into authoritarianism until the people can't take it anymore and they revolt and then we cycle back to a more democratic form of government and we just keep going and going and going. If you've never read Arthur Schlesinger's Cycles of History, if you've never read any political science that addresses this, we see this play out regularly and consistently throughout history. The great experiment was that our founding fathers weren't going to leave it just open-ended to our own devices. They wove in that there is a better chance for the United States of America because the very principles that God brings down through his word and the very idea of the power of God within the individual gives it a chance. And when we talk about free moral agency, right, we talk about the, the desire, you know, God doesn't want a theocracy where a, a, a powerful structure forces us to worship him. Talk to Daniel about that if you haven't read that book of the Bible. That's not love. If I hold a hammer over your head and say, tell me you love me or I'm going to hit you with this hammer and you say, oh, I love you. That's not love. But if there is, you know, if we grow and we know one another, all those different things, and you say, I love you. You know what? I love you. I love you. I love you too. That's love. And so this society is created in which free moral agents can make that decision freely. And I believe that's where, what God wants. He knows that what will come with individual liberties is the idea that the person beside me may be blaspheming the Lord. Right. And so there, there and we're getting into it now, but there we go with, you know, what do we accept in a society that is founded on individual liberties and what do we not accept? And then that begins to erode the idea of complete individual liberties. And then they begin to consolidate the power above us. And now all of a sudden you can say these things. You can't say these things. You can do this. You can't do that. And the cycle is progressing humans humans so there you go hey a little bit of theology today a little bit of pol political science I was going to say poli-sci for us geeks 
a little bit of theology, a little bit of political science, a little bit of history. You get it all at turning on the lights. Some things to think about. I hope you're thinking about these things. Part of the biggest problem today is that nobody is thinking about these things. Our children and grandchildren are not taught to think about these things. They're not taught to value anything but self and how it relates to a powerful government that tells that self what to say, when to say it, how to say it, what's correct, what's not correct. So, anyway, there we are, 849. People are blowing up my phone. It's time to get to work, I guess. I've had enough time off. I got to get things going. We've got everything from landscaping to the service on Sunday to take care of. <clears throat> Last week was a whew, busy week around here, serve week. Got the picnic tables ready to stain. We don't know when we're going to stain them, but we do need a few more hands if you are a church Tonian. I don't know exactly know when we're going to do it, but we gotta get those babies stained now that we have the edges routed off and everything sanded, got a new fire pit built, got everything weeded, and we're gonna put down rubber mulch around. Rubber mulch. Not wooden mulch. Get rid of those termites and we don't want them back. We're gonna do matting and rubber mulch. How about that? Repurposed old tires. So, God bless you guys. I thank you for tuning in this morning. Interact with the video. <clears throat> Share the video. Like the video. Make a comment. You need prayer today? You send me a personal message. Or you can put it here for us all to pray. If you think that I'm full of junk, let me know that I'm full of junk. And, but if you, if you have some other comment to make, make some other comment. Father God, thank you so much for the time that we get to spend together. We do just love it. You make it possible. May you bless us on our ways, dear Father, and by the power of your Holy Spirit that's made possible through the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus the Christ, in whom we believe. Help us to see your vision for our lives. May your will be done by your power. In Jesus' name. God bless you guys. Thank you so much. And we may not see you on Thursday. I know I've got both grandkids on Thursday. Thursday's becoming that day. So we'll see how willing Kelly is to wrestle two grandchildren in the morning for about a half an hour. Um, and we'll see how that works out. But God bless you guys. I love you. And we'll see you again on Turning on the Lights. <laughs>